first of all, um, I would like to thank the organizers of the RGB Expert and Developers Workshop for agreeing to have me present. Um, I really feel a little bit sad that I couldn't be there in person, but I've got commitments here at the moment. So my days kind of started at three, just before three this morning and I'll probably finish around nine o'clock tonight, but it was well worth it. I've really enjoyed the previous sessions. Um, that I've been able to attend for. This presentation is the joint one between myself. I'm the um, training, uh, I'm one of the teachers at the Bureau of Meteorology Training Center. I'm also the point of contact of the Australian VLAB Center of Excellence. Um, I will be presenting RGB usage in the Asia um, Pacific Ocean region, and that will be followed by my colleague, Rian Salman from BMKG Indonesia, who will be more, uh, talk more specifically about a particular RGB composite used over that region. Next slide, please. And so this gives an idea of the uh, topics to be discussed uh, during this 30 minute session. And next slide, please. For my topic, what I would like to point out is, first of all, just giving an idea of the popularity of RGB composites across our Asia um, Pacific region, um, followed by RGB case studies on the Australian VLAB Centre of Excellence Regional Focus Group Meeting Archive webpage. I've mentioned this a couple of times already during the uh, the past presentations. It really is a treasure trove of recordings. So uh, it's a way of advertising it as well. And then I'll just go very quickly into teaching the mechanics of RGB composites. Next slide, please. So this is um, comes out of a research paper that I co-authored with some bureau staff where we interviewed uh, half, approximately half of bureau forecasters, and it gives an idea of the popularity of various satellite data amongst bureau forecasting staff. And so you can see that you've got the um, RGB composites there on the y-axis. On the x-axis, you have the number of participants voting for these, and uh, you, it's divided up into uh, the uh, large positive impact or a positive impact or no impact of these RGB composites. And this is changing over from the earlier um, MTSAT to um, onto actually using Himawari data where we could generate this data. So the benefit, the impact of those. Um, the significant impact in red that was the large positive impact is where the, there's a greater confidence in using the satellite data but with other observations playing a subservient role. Whereas the improvement or the positive impact is where you're able to use the RGB composite to detect new features, but uh, you still need other data to verify that. So you can see that the night microphysics is very, very popular there. And one of the reasons, of course, is that it allowed us to view fog and low, uh, low cloud uh, overnight. And uh, that's really, really important, particularly for aviation. Um, you'll notice too, the low response for the volcanic ash RGB right down the bottom there. And again, just cautioning that uh, when you're looking at these statistics, you have to consider that actually only a very, very small um, subset of our forecasters are involved in volcanic ash, uh, in the volcanic ash advisory center. And uh, next slide, please. Okay, so this is uh, essentially another uh, statistics which was um, conducted during the Asia Oceania Meteorological Satellite User Conference number 10 training event. There were 45 attendees from 25 countries. And uh, looking at that, you can see the different RGB composites there and the number of people who actually uh, use this. So uh, use this a lot during their work. And you'll see that um, we use the Socrative cloud-based uh, learner response system to get this uh, feedback anonymously during the um, during this training event. You'll notice that the true color RGB is indeed the most popular here. The night microphysics and also the uh, day convection and the air mass RGB are also popular. So trying to reconcile these differences 
Um, the nine microphysics uh, uh, RGB is perhaps not so uh, uh, not so widely used over the deep tropics because there is that moisture signature which uh, makes it a little bit less effective than over mid latitudes. And of course, our bureau forecasters they they needed to do a lot of catching up in interpreting water vapor imagery, which means it's one reason why the air mass RGB was not so popular uh, within our bureau compared to say um, more broadly. And next slide, please. Uh, there we go. All right, so I'll go on to the next um, part of my presentation, which is essentially um, these regional focus group meetings. And you can see the web link there with the archive. We've been conducting these since October 2013, and the US are really, really significant, um, not only uh, attendees, but contributors as well, and other uh, Asia Pacific regions as well. Now, <clears throat> the thing is, uh, since the last uh, uh, RGB expert and developers um, workshop, we've actually conducted 54 of these sessions. So 54 sessions since 2017. And during many of these sessions, we've uh, looked at RGB composites and the application of those. Now, I'll give you a few examples over the next few uh, slides and they deal with the RGB composites, uh, the new ones, but also ones that we've adapted um, as well um, and to our region. Um, next slide, please. Okay, so one of the things that I was really keen to do after returning from the RGB expert and developers workshop was to just to apply the goodies. And so a number of new and modified RGB composites, um, I've applied those to a tropical, you can see that in the top right hand side, and also in the uh, bottom left hand side, you can see a mid latitude uh, feature. And so the idea was to, um, for example, we've had the MS RGB sandwich product, which is using an MS RGB overlain by, if you like, uh, the top layer of the sandwich product, the enhanced infrared, as recommended by Hans Peter Ressley. And so uh, that was used. We also used uh, applied the tropical uh, day convection RGB, the cloud phase RGB. Um, we also looked at the Himawari a water vapor RGB, the two of those that JMA put together. And we evaluated those, put them side by side with existing satellite data and also um, RGB composites to work out just how well they picked out important features for squall line, tropical squall lines, and the mid-latitude low pressure systems. Um, some key points, uh, the daytime squall line uh, situation, the tropical tuned RGB, Composite was quite popular. Uh, looking at the daytime mid latitude cold front situation, the cloud phase RGB seemed to do better than in the tropics because you tended to get a little bit more, uh, how can I say, uh, more features at cloud top. The, um, at nighttime, the air mass RGB in the mid latitudes is really good because not only do you get the cloud top details when you're putting over the enhanced IR, but you're also getting those air masses and the areas of high PV. And of course, the JMA or water vapor version two is quite good in picking out the PV anomaly. Next slide, please. So then just going on, here's some highlights of application of RGB composites to regional case studies since that time. So, um, uh, as mentioned pre previously by Curtis, the uh, fire temperature RGB, we've also been uh, comparing that for Australian case studies, and I noticed Cur Curtis showed a couple there as well, but linking it to other data, including the infrared line scanning by aeroplanes, and you can see that on the top um, left-hand side. We've compared tropical to mid and mid-latitude versions of both the night microphysics RGB in the center, and the day convection RGB bottom right there. And even the idea of tuning this uh, day convection RGB for wintertime storms over Australia and the idea of potentially having a, a, a varying tropopause height incorporated in this um, RGB, in this uh, day convection RGB uh, composite to, uh, in order to 
or how can I say, overcome the difficulty between high tropopause in the tropics and low tropopause at mid latitudes. Um, also, um, not to forget, Dr. Haysook Park from KMA presented a modified version of the dust RGB composite. And you can see that on the bottom left hand side. That's particularly useful in detecting thin dust during nighttime in the winter season. And you can see what RG, uh, our regional focus group meeting this was covered. And so looking at the web link that I showed earlier, you'll be able to find that. And one thing I would like to uh, expand on a little bit more for a couple of minutes is this, uh, um, this volcanic ash RGB and mesosphere uh, injections from the Hunga Tonga, Hunga Hapai eruption near Tonga in January 2022. Next slide, please. And so by looking at looking at this case study, you were actually looking at a number of RGB composites. Um, uh, first of all, the MS RGB was used to help monitor the shock wave that traveled out um, from the uh, from the eruption. The ash RGB uh, was used for um, uh, to uh, monitor the um, thin ash emissions in the vicinity of the volcano, and I'll talk a bit more about that in the next two slides, and the sulfur dioxide um, uh, that was spread out further away from the volcano. The true color RGB was um, used to assist the monitoring of the wider dispersal of the ash over the Australian region, so Tonga being to the east of Australia, the, and also the discoloration of the ocean both prior and post the eruption. The true color RGB was quite good. Um, and so just going on to the next slide, please. Um, one of the interesting things we found was that the ash RGB has the potential to reveal a translucent emission of ash that appeared to be difficult to resolve in other satellite imagery. What you'll see on the left hand side is some American researchers um, used the Himawari 8 and GO17 uh, imagery of the eruption in stereo viewing to determine that the height of that eruption was in excess of 50 kilometers, so it was in the mesosphere. When I uh, examined the ash RGB at the time, and you can see in the top right hand side the thick high cloud and the overshooting top, you actually also saw this translucent tendril of volcanic ash that appeared to project above that overshooting top. And that could also be picked up in the shadow um, in the true color RGB. So if we look at that a little bit more closely, next slide, please. You can kind of see the um, erupt the uh, ash emission in the red, translucent, not so visible in the true color, but then casting, potentially casting the shadow. Next slide, please. And um, you can see that there. So what that means is that potentially some of the RGBs uh, can, uh, are actually provide a lot more information. Um, and it's really a case of, and I found it quite by accident, just by scanning through it. So this idea of just um, viewing a particular phenomenon under a number of RGBs is really, really useful. Um, next slide, please. For my final slide, I simply want to point out that in order to teach um, the RGB composites, um, the uh, permit students faster uptake of these RGB composites, um, I've put together this, what I call an RGB teaching quick guide. And so what that shows essentially is, and it's quite successful, the students found that, you know, somebody who hasn't looked at something as complicated as a day convection RGB are able to take on it really, really quickly. Um, you'll see at number one, panel one is the construct of the RGB, including the recipe and the palette and its appearance. Panel two, the Various beams are explained uh, with simple but accurate uh, pictorial schematics underneath. Number three, panel three, the RGB composite image of a severe storm over Eastern Australia is actually decomposed into its various beams and each beam is interrogated what it actually means in terms of cloud or lack of cloud moisture in the atmosphere, microphysics, temperature and so forth. And the final slide is really the gamma enhancement, the, um, uh, the advantage of the gamma enhancement applied here to the green beam. Um, and so I'd like to 
finish off, and, and that is, of course, my final slide. To summarize, I've shown feedback regarding RGB composite use and impact by our regional colleagues. Um, I've shown where the archive case studies utilizing RGB uh, composite data are located on our VLAB webpage. I've given some examples of how classical or modified or new RGB composite images have been adapted to local case studies. And finally, this RGB teaching quick guide that I hope you will find useful. Thank you. Thank you, Bodo. So we'll hold questions until after uh, Rion's presentation. And so uh, Rion is coming up now. Thank you very much. Thank you for the opportunity. And thank you for Debbie and Remo and uh, Sierra, especially Dan and Bernie. And I uh, will give my presentation about cloud-based distinction RGB for a convective initiation on tropical region, developed by JMA. Okay, the background is a uh, limitation for my uh, uh, agency that uh, to observe the atmospheric, uh, especially on East Indonesia region. So uh, the lack of a radar and a surface observation system, that is uh, the, the, the one of uh, main background here. And uh, uh, my island and my responsibility area in the eastern part of Indonesia, we have uh, many small islands with local characteristics that can impact to the weather. So we need tools that can cover or um, observe for the atmosphere, especially. And uh, that uh, one thing is the forecaster need the signal of convective initiation. That is very important because uh, we can uh, see that is uh, many agency develop the impact best forecast or impact best warning forecast that are useful for make early warning to early action. So that is uh, my um, uh, uh, island and my responsibility area near uh, Papua and Sulawesi and uh, North uh, Australia. So. We have uh, the characteristic of the island that uh, very, very uh, local. That is a big sea. You can search in the internet, Banda Sea. And uh, that impact uh, local uh, characteristic of weather. So uh, uh, this is my uh, responsibility area with the small island. You can see that it, in each uh, small island, we have uh, people in there. So we have to make sure they can uh, uh, get our information that uh, not covered by radar and uh, super observation. So about the RGB product, uh, main uh, application, the analytics of uh, thickness of the top uh, heat and cold pace and limitation uh, maybe that can be in the only and the advantages of the 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 RTP product is uh, facilitation of determination between high level ice cloud and low level weather clouds and detail to describe of uh, cloud pieces so that is very important it is uh, very open and it's not uh, operationally in BMKG but, but for my uh, responsibility area, for my station, I have to develop one uh, of uh, uh, like uh, one tools that uh, can cover uh, forecaster to make the best decision. So uh, the CV from um, JMA, we can see that is uh, red, green, and blue that uh, uh, bands from IHI bands and uh, to describe that uh, physical relation to cloud top temperature, cloud optical thickness, and cloud phase snow and ice. So uh, it's very important we know that that is very uh, delivered from uh, satellite. I use satellite to make this from Jamie. Thank you for Jamie. And uh, uh, we have a good collaboration with Jamie and the color interpretation. So that is a simple. Uh, RGB uh, analysis uh, in the flash fruit in my uh, responsibility area. That is uh, one of uh, we call Haruku Islands. And it is small island, but uh, you imagine if um, big CB 
that uh, develop in this island and many people in there. So we want to make the one resolution that uh, offer radar. So um, this is uh, the interpretation. So now operationally in uh, BMKG, we just use this uh, sandwich product. Then unfortunately, it cannot describe detail. So for my uh, responsibility, I hope you all can help us to develop more about um, the RGB recipe, especially for tropical region. Because in many uh, uh, time I discuss with you all in uh, many conferences, the, you just uh, have uh, uh, made uh, some uh, recipe for uh, uh, tropical region, but for the, 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 the unfortunately, like a slider, you not uh, put the tropical region recipe. And uh, for JMA, uh, they have a website that cover all uh, RGB uh, recipe for um, uh, Himawari, but they not put the for, especially for tropical region that I mentioned. So after this, maybe we, we can discuss more about that. So that is uh, my, um, uh, short um, uh, analysis about uh, the the RGB I compare with the radar with the cross section tools that we can see uh, the, for this first time in uh, the, the the Ambon Island. This is Ambon Island, very small island, and Haruku Island. We can see that uh, develop thick low level water clouds and thick low level ice cloud. And after this, in the uh, 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 for the next, the 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 the, 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 the an, another island in the three UTC, we can see the 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 the, the analysis of interpretation the thick low level ice cloud and thick low level water clouds here. But unfortunately, uh, for this island, we cannot cover with radar. So imagine we can use the satellite to cover our area. Or all area, and from this uh, analysis from the radar, it show the convection, deep convection uh, occur in this stage. So it uh, uh, very uh, related and connected that uh, uh, we can use the uh, this RGB for cover the my responsibility area. So you can see in the 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 animation that we can see the much of uh, RGB uh, for this uh, RGB that cover this is like uh, a cumulonimbus stage. Okay, you can see in the cross section uh, tools in here and here. After one hour, we can see uh, the developing of cumulonimbus very. Uh, uh, very uh, good develop in this area and this is uh, described about the uh, uh, the the the, the relativity of uh, the many uh, of um, uh, cloud of uh, with the uh, deep convection so for conclusion the cloud based distinction rgb that developed by jma can be useful on tropical region. I hopefully the it, uh, recipe can use uh, for another uh, country in the tropical region uh, and eastern part, especially in eastern part of Indonesia, like Maluku, Papua, and Sulawesi, without uh, to change to uh, tropical recipe. The result after compare with the radar show that RGB worked good for the uh, the, the, the station signal from thick low level ice clouds and it helps forecaster to make decision for early warning and no casting. Now in our agency develop uh, impact based forecast and we will uh, determine to develop impact based warning forecast. So I think uh, RGB can be useful if we can consider to develop more in tropical region. Thank you very much. Thank you, Rion, and thank you, Bodo. Um, we're going to start with questions here with Curtis in the room. Uh, th this is just a comment that uh, so you mentioned you wanted more 
tropical recipes on slider and i am the person to talk to if you want new products on slider so we can we can talk offline yeah i think the this theme of tropical versus mid-latitude recipes is one that um is going to be common this week and i imagine it's been discussed at previous workshops too i think after we get um our africa perspective tomorrow um in the morning um our time that'll add some more information from you know the of course central part of africa is very much tropical as well uh, yeah jose yeah, great. Thanks, then. Uh, great presentations again. And uh, what I know, Bodo is there, but uh, and he has a lot of experience with the tropical part. But uh, I have a couple of comments to say that might be useful for Ryan. Uh, one of them is, uh, well, I saw earlier that, well, Bill has been playing a lot with these, like, tuning RGBs, and I saw that you actually had a, a slide with this one, the Degla phase distinctions, but you could actually see the tops of the convection, maybe by playing with the thresholds of the reflectivity once you construct the RGB. So, I mean, that's an idea of, because in the tropics, you know, the solar angle is right there and, and the reflectivity can be really high and you don't really, you look really bright yellow on the on that RGB. So you may be able, you know, to talk to some people maybe and tune that up. And then uh, we also, basically what we do with Bernie, Bernie, I, Bernie, me and other group, well, Marcel is involved and other people around here. Uh, we do these monthly sessions uh, similar to what Bodo does for uh, for your region, and so we look at the tropics very often. So uh, we can talk after. I have some ideas. I mean, uh, we look at other stuff as well. But uh, yeah, there's there's a lot to do for sure. I would love to hear about those as well, actually. So um, if that can be passed on, that'd be great. Definitely. Thanks, Bodo. Mark. Um, to two things super quickly. One was the um, in the 2017 workshop, the tropical stuff was first discovered, uh, discovered, discussed, and so there's the starts of the um, discrimination of what's useful in the tropics. So it's great if that can be deepened here. I think that would be really, really cool. Um, the other one, which is maybe a more generic question, a lot of us use the sandwich product, and we use a rainbow color scale on there. And I'm wondering if that's really a helpful color scale to have there because it's not linear. So you've got that little yellow line that stands out, et cetera. So I'm wondering if there's a better color scale that we can use on the top of um, the sandwich. Um, choices of infrared color scales is a, a good way to make everyone start fighting amongst themselves here because certainly there's def everyone has their own opinion on that topic. But yeah, I mean, it's certainly worth consideration on what is ideal. Yeah, it is. Bernie and then Yvonne. Okay. And this question is for Galena and potentially Curtis, because I've heard that um, at some point you might be merging the um, proxy vis with the geo color for nighttime, better identification of nighttime clouds over water surfaces, especially the ocean. And so will that include some coloring of like currently the low level clouds are bluish um, because that's, you know, one of the things that we notice that over a lot of the tropical regions, the current geo color just does not show a lot of the low level clouds. Yeah, so I'm, I'm working on that algorithm right now and it should be on slider in a few weeks, I would, I would say, but the, the goal is to make the proxy visible version look like GeoColor does now, where low co low clouds are blue, and so that it's not gonna it's not gonna be a difference that way. It's just that that proxy vis shows more low clouds than than the GeoColor algorithm currently does. For Ryan, then that um, I don't know if you've looked at proxy vis. It doesn't show the deep convection convection aspect, but um, it does show some of that. One of the other things, um, well, Kathy Ann's not here, so I guess I don't know if I should make the comment. Recently, there was a discussion about oh, some of the air mass RGB shows ghost moisture. So at some point, we'll have to follow up with. Um, um, the air mass folks on that. Yvonne? Oh, do we have anything online, Bernie? Can you help? Let's see. 
So I have a comment. Yes, please. Yeah, it's regarding the cloud phase RGB, and there's something that I, you know, you, you, when you're trying to make a presentation, there's so many additional slides that have had to be chopped out, and this is definitely one of these. We found the cloud phase RGB actually quite useful to um, identify convection, in other words, thunderstorm formation, where the cloud top temperatures are actually warmer than minus 20. So, you know, over inland Australia, that often happens. And it often catches us the, the forecaster by surprise, suddenly getting lightning out of cloud tops that are maybe, I don't know, minus five degrees or minus 10. And the cloud face picks it up really well. And there's something that Jim Purdom, actually one of your uh, colleagues, I uh, believe, uh, mentioned, uh, concentrate on the 3.9 micron or your ice crystal, uh, uh, the one that's, uh, good in discriminating sort of particulate size as well as potentially phase changes as well. So so I don't know to what extent you might have that in the States where you have convection developing from really warm uh, top clouds as well. But this is where the cloud fade RGB has been quite useful. Yeah, I mean, I, I will say we definitely do have low top and sometime warm top convection here, depending on various factors, including the season and the location. Um, so yeah, that that it, your points are very valid. Let's go to Yvonne, and then a, there was a comment or a question online. Yeah, it's it's a little bit connected to um, air mass RGB uh, overlaid with uh, IR. Um, I think almost equally good would be tropical um, air mass RGB, which kind of shows the 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 very cold or a high reaching. Um, um, areas of the anvil, so to say. Um, so that could be uh, perhaps uh, equally good. Um, and uh, my question about your assessment of, of uh, you, how, how well are the RGBs used? Um, it's a question that uh, could it be that responses could be biased by um, how well the uh, users are trained to use different RGBs. Um, I guess um, if uh, if if there is more training on on the products, maybe they they um, it would be eye opening for for some users to start using uh, more um, other products. Yeah, I think that. Sorry, I'll let you finish. No, no, no. Thank you. Yeah, uh, that that is quite valid. I think too. Um, and part of it also is that um, the, the definitely the, something like the night microphysics gets used a lot, and therefore um, and it works very well, and so it gets a really really good rapport. Um, other and the classic case is a day convection RGB that originally had very very high marks because you know it was picking out the um, the small ice crystal. Uh, fountains coming out of developing CB, so it was a proxy for severity. But then I started getting a lot of feedback from our tropical forecasters. It's over forecast, it's all over the shop. We started introducing the tropical version of the day convection RGB, and it turns out that sometimes that works well in the tropics and sometimes it doesn't. And so this idea of um, you know developing it still further, taking into account tropopause pause height, um, might then mean so it becomes more derived products might then, you know, sort of elevate the product to its true popularity. So perhaps it's underutilized because because it, it doesn't take as a single RGB doesn't take into account these mid latitude tropical variations, winter time variations as well. All right. So uh, Jose here. And uh, as an experience, I mean, not specifically speaking about development of RGBs, but ways that we could also handle this uh, forecasting in tropicals, in the tropics, especially uh, short term, right? When you're starting to see, say, convective initiation. Um, a lot of times in the tropic, you have what, like, some people don't like this term, but the TOTS, the tropical upper tropospheric troughs, and they can be kind of subtle. And uh, sometimes it's, it's, most of the times it's a tot that has a little bit of the dry air aloft. And when the dry air is aloft or in the mid troposphere, that can actually help with the triggering of this violent convection that 
sometimes you, you're not sure. So that's uh, just by having an idea of where these systems are, you can look at you know the air mass or water vapor ones, or just look at the cloud tops in different different satellite products and have an idea if you have an upper circulation nearby and then have an idea where the moisture is. And if you see that and you see convective initiation, then that, I mean, these type of tools could also give you an idea of if you need to worry or not. You know, this is not RGB specifically, but you know different tools that you could use and also for example winds I, I, i'm not sure if you are, does, is, does your if your island has a lot of topography or not but you know also wind direction in those levels you may have this very subtle orographic forcing and we had this case a couple of well last week two weeks ago with this uh tropical cycle in central america and uh you could see the satellite imagery in costa rica and it didn't look as impressive, but they got like 350 millimeters of rain uh, just from this like very subtle warm rain process. So, you know, there are other tools that you at least can use to balance your your analysis and to improve your forecasting while other RGBs are developed. Yeah. If I can make a vote, I'm sorry, please. You can go ahead, or, or I'll quick make my comment in terms of the training. Uh, another thing about our monthly sessions is that we do, or Jose does, and then sometimes I fill in with um, the use of the product depending upon what we're highlighting. Um, but we show the products, and I think um, the, the people that are listening in to them, you know, see us pointing out features or they ask questions about them, and so that also helps with training. Just by showing it and having people regularly show up. And so then they explore it more often. Um, I know that um, some forecasters in, I think it was Diego who was telling me, he, Diego's from Brazil, that some forecasters in El Salvador, they took one of their products and just started displaying it um, in their system. And then the forecaster started using it. Yeah, what we found really useful within our VLAB, and it's something that we actually inherited from, I believe you met that, you met Cal, is the idea of cultivating local champions. And of course, Rion is one of our champions, and I do believe Jordan Girth is another one, and Handasan is another champion. And of course, uh, having a network of these really um, allows that information to flow backwards and forwards as well. So uh, that, that's really, really beneficial. Um, maybe just a quick comment about the MS RGB, and that is and why the MS RGB in combination with the um, enhanced infrared is so useful, because it picks up not only storm top temperature features, but also the different air masses around the developing system. Um, and finally, this idea of actually putting a new RGB in a you know, in, in a series of animations, almost like what I've shown my slides. So you're showing an animation next to another one, next to another one, next to another one, all different RGBs or satellite products for a particular event. The, the person looking at that will right away go, wow, I like this product. It's a really good way of showcasing something new because you're comparing it against what they used to. So putting, the, putting it all on one slide, we found really effective. Thanks, Bodo. Bodo, there is a question online that is rather long. Um, I was wondering if you wanted to take a shot at um, at answering that, um, since uh, the the question was posed, I believe, during your presentation. Okay. Um, because um, I just have to check. Just bear with me for a minute. So, so while you're checking, I will read it here for everyone. Oh in the yes, word. Please, please, please read it. That's much better. Yeah, absolutely. Mm -hmm. So the question is from, and I again I'll apologize for the name, um, Ab Abdel Fattah. The question is, um, do you think that sat image, satellite image could provide forecasters with more details or information in the future? Because as we know, there is a real concurrence between meteorological numerical models and satellite images. The last could describe only the external appearance, and we need more information about the inner part of clouds and air masses. Could satellite image lose their importance and models replace it in the future? 
<laughs> I teach satellite meteorology and I'm of the old school saying observations first, NWP second. And of course, for me, therefore, I think it's more a symbiotic relationship between the two. And your classic case is if you're looking at satellite imagery, well, you've got the imagery, which is, of course, your traditional visual uh, vis IR and that sensors, cloud tops and so forth. But if once you go into the microwave spectrum, you're looking right through it. And I was looking at some animations. In fact, I presented it during our 101st regional focus group meeting, what the future will look like in 2031. And the Americans or and I guess colleagues in other parts of the world already investigating, actually looking at satellite data that's been rendered in 3D. Um, and potentially blended with NWP, where you can go and in, sort of go around systems and go into systems, almost like in virtual reality. So um, th that is my point of view. And, and I guess the really important part that I always tell my students is, and it's something an old forecaster told me when I was much, much younger in years, never use one source of meteorological data in isolation. Never use satellite data in isolation. But by the same token, the other rule I like to have is observations first, NWP second, because NWP is derived. It's something that goes through a machine and uh, it abstracts. So hopefully that's answered the question. Yeah, thank you. I, I believe you did. I step off my soapbox. It's a real uh, topic of. I, I think many people in the room here would agree with your comments on that. Okay, last call for questions or, oh, sorry, I couldn't see your hand. Yes, uh, thank you, Bodo and uh, Rian for your very good presentation. Uh, Rian, just a question for you. Uh, in Ambon, there is no, is, is it true there is no weather radar? Just one. Just one. He says he has just one weather radar so, on the island. Thank you. Um, so there's a couple things. So we've talked a lot about uh, visible infrared RGBs. I, I know that there are a few RGBs that use microwave data. And I think, Bodo, you, you talked about the future that um, um, additional techniques for, for three dimensions in, in the atmosphere. I think that uh, in the future, we're probably going to have constellations of uh, uh, small satellites in LEO that may be able to provide additional information inside the cloud that may be helpful. Uh, another thing that we haven't really talked about that, that could be done, and I hear this coming out when it comes to uh, tropics, is normalizing RGBs with some kind of um, uh, mean atmospheric temperature or possibly um, using the min and the max based on the warmest and coldest temperature in the profile. Now that would make interpretation perhaps far more challenging, um, but I think you know we, we did look very slightly at combining numerical weather prediction data uh, analyses, I should say, with satellite data um, in the U.S., but it never was, it was mainly just a prototype. It never was anything that we um, brought into the uh, uh, operations. But I, I just wonder your thoughts, Bodo, on whether you think that uh, from your perspective as a trainer and Rion, there's an opportunity to combine uh, model analyses and uh, satellite data um, in, in some way that's either controlling the bounds of the RGB or as an actual layer, uh, as one of the, the three channels in the RGB, if you will. Um, if I can maybe answer that first, is that all right with you, Rian? No, you, you first. Yeah, um, I guess what I've hinted on before, this idea of being able to uh, tune the day convection RGB based upon the, um, the NWP-derived tropopause height, 
particularly for the green bean, is one example where you're sort of getting a satellite product using NWP and potentially, uh, if you like, um, generating derived quantitative products. And I do believe that's really a hot cake with the WMO. I think it's something that in a previous um, Asia Oceania Meteorological Satellite User Conference, a greater use of this derived quantitative data. The limitations, of course, with that quantitative, uh, the derived quantitative um, product is that they are to some extent algorithm and model dependent. So you get day, night discontinuities, you can get all sorts of artifacts that need to be, um, uh, you should address that. And you don't quite have that with the, with that rather more continuous display that you get at least in the latitude and longitude with, um, with satellite imagery. Having said that, the advantage of a derived product is that you can start incorporating it into a climatology far more readily than, say, satellite imagery, which is, of course, these are, of course, color values. So that's my take on it. I hope that I've addressed that to some extent there, um, Jordan. Rian has some comments too. Yeah, in my uh, responsibility area, Jordan, uh, we do uh, some uh, research about uh, what uh, JMA develop rapid cumulonimbus development area that uh, can help us to uh, see the uh, convective initiation. And uh, in my headquarter, work with the radar and um, uh, satellite subdivision. We work to combine the, like uh, some uh, analysis about uh, 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 modeling in weather with the radar and uh, satellite, but it's uh, in progress. So that from this analysis, we can uh, support that uh, uh, data and uh, can work for the future. That is my. Okay, I believe we have reached the end of the agenda time on this topic, so let's give our speakers one more hand.